Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for joining this webinar, the first of ECLA's City Resilience Stories webinar series. The title of today's edition is COVID-19, Coping, Learning and Building Urban Resilience with Chief Resilience Officers David Jacome Polit from Quito, Ecuador, and Piero Pellizzaro from Milan, Italy. Uh, my name is Victoria Vital Estrada. I'm Resilient Development Program Officer at the ECLA World Secretariat. I will be moderating this webinar along with my colleagues, Basileos Latinos, a Climate Adaptation and Urban Resilience Officer at the ICLE European Secretariat, and Zoe Duruti, Resilient Development Program Assistant at the ICLE World Secretariat. Um, we are delighted uh, to welcome uh, the over 100, uh, 500 participants that are joining us today from different parts of the world, uh, representatives from government, business, academia, and civil, civil society. Um, given the large uh, number of participants, uh, we will collect questions from the audience through the chat. So please uh, send your questions during the, the presentations and we will uh, go back to them during the Q&A part. This is our program and uh, we're, we will be starting now. So our first speaker today would be David Hagomepolit. He's the Metropolitan Director of the Resi of Resilience in the Municipality of the Metropolitan District of Quito. He's also the Chief Resilience Officer for the Global Resilience Cities Network. He's an undergraduate professor at the University of the Americas and a professor of architecture and sustainability at the Catholic University, both in Quito. He's also a former member of the STM Committee for the Resilient Cities Congress series organized by ICLE. So as, as you can see, he has a great experience in the field of resilience and he, we're very excited to have you here, David. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you very much um, for you know, inviting me, for uh, having me uh, in this um, series. I hope you can see me. Uh, Yes, we can see your um, your screen. Yeah. And now you can see my presentation, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, uh, my presentation's name is The Challenge of COVID-19, Reaching the Most Needed, which is um, right now a priority for the city of Quito. What, I, what I'm about to present is um, how we are identifying um, vulnerable population um, and this work is based on a paper that was presented a couple of years ago um, uh, on a proceedings and the idea of the paper was to map out uh, vulnerable population and to compare that to how natural threats um, are spread in the territory. Um, So um, our approach um, uh, during these uh, times uh, is to identify the location of the most needed, and I'm going to tell you how. Uh, after that, um, uh, data required us to quantify the number of people who needs assistance because we don't have definitive numbers. Um, the next step was to define the city's capacity to provide food, and you will see how based on uh, our diets, um, minimum diets, um, we need to uh, pay attention into uh, what might be uh, in shortage uh, for the city. Uh, the next step uh, has been to establish effective uh, partnerships uh, with organizations. We've been successful uh, at some point uh, with certain partners, but we still need to work uh, and improve and fine tune um, uh, our work with another partners and organizations. Um, and um, this work of quantifying and defining a uh, vulnerable population uh, uh, is, enabling, is enabling us to provide um, reliable um, sources of information uh, on one hand. And also um, by the use of um, technology and, and, and by the work done on the ground, uh, it has been um, possible to strengthen the networks with neighborhood leaders, which are basically the people that we are uh, relying on to get um, um, first-hand information on what's going on there and how can we uh, improve uh, uh, 
the support that the municipality of Quito is uh, providing. So in a very general way, uh, and probably most of you know about this, but disasters are basically a complex, in, a complex interaction of uh, potential da uh, damaging physical events, which affects uh, mainly vulnerable, vulnerable population. And um, we have a hazard right now, which is a pandemic. Um, I, um, uh, exposure is not so uh, critical right now because uh, the pandemic is basically something that can be spread in, 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 in the territory without having um, geographical um, limits as some other hazards uh, would do. And in this, in this sense, choosing indicators accordingly is necessary to create and a specific index, which is uh, one of the components of what I'm about to show you, so that we can make better decisions and be more accurate uh, and effective in terms of the kind of uh, help that we provide. So in a general way, um, um, uh, acute shocks or, or threats are the ones that um, create emergencies, but, are, uh, but, but the chronic stresses, especially socioeconomic vulnerability are, the, the ones that prevent uh, cities or communities uh, to uh, jump back and, and uh, be healthy again or, and, or without uh, no problems. But in this case, as like, like I was saying before, the threat that we are facing is a pandemic, which is different than the, what we have been uh, preparing before in terms of landslides or earth, earthquakes, uh, forest fires, and, and so on. So the, the threat, uh, requires us to respond in a different way, but the socioeconomic vulnerability remains basically the same. So the targeted groups that need most uh, help uh, remain the same. Um, when it comes to response capacity, uh, I, I think uh, the whole pandemic uh, in, in the case of ECO or in the case of Quito, uh, or of Quito are really testing uh, different systems, um, risk management systems on one hand and how we are able to organize uh, between different different levels of government and so on, but also how different um, um, other systems work. For example, health systems, how how strong or weak they are, or food systems, which are really tested also uh, along these uh, these times. And uh, I think this is uh, quite important or in, in order to understand what we need to improve um, to to better face uh, these kind of situations. So um, in a very general way, um, this is not so relevant, but I just wanted to mention that there is a whole a methodology behind of how we are putting together information um, and, and how we are able to show uh, that information, uh, which basically is a simple method based on a, on a Pareto method to aggregate these different indicators. Um, and the first point here is how do we understand socioeconomic vulnerability? And, uh, there we have the first um, problem because uh, we are basing the information on the 2010 census, uh, which shows, for example, where economically inactive population is located or where non-affiliated to social security system people are located. And that's those are the different proxies that we are using to understand um, um, a, a people uh, who have less resources since the census the census doesn't include um, economic income uh, for these populations but also we are able to understand who has access to transportation or or, or, to, or to basic services these all configure uh, what we understand uh, socioeconomic vulnerability and enables enables us to um, act accordingly but also uh, there is a gender component and, and as you can see uh, we are um, focusing mainly on caregiving women and single mothers. And um, what is interesting about these two maps is to understand that vulnerability spreads along the territory in a very, in, a, in an heterogeneous way. It is not homogeneous. So uh, some of those efforts need to be uh, focused and tailor-made accordingly on how this population um, is, is uh, distributed. And then we have population uh, with disabilities uh, also uh, uh, that which also also shows us uh, who are not able to uh, leave home, for example, and, and get food. And so then we need to adjust 
again, our, our strategies to, to reach them. And um, the next step, once we understood uh, how this population is spread along the territory, is to actually come up with uh, uh, numbers which are which need to be fine-tuned because, as I was mentioning before, we were using we are using census the census of 2010 uh, numbers. So what we did is we made projections, and now we we understand that we have somewhere around 260,000 people that need to be attended as a priority. But we also understand how they are located and distributed based on, on, on those maps, uh, of course. And um, as you can see also, we are including uh, migrants, um, immigrants in this, in this analysis, since we've received um, a lot of um, brothers and sisters from Venezuela for the past years, and they also need to be uh, taken into account and, and, and taken care of. Um, the next step was about food production and, and production, how we are able to uh, feed the population based on um, the minimum caloric requirements um, and, and based on our uh, dietary habits. And as you can see, we have a few red numbers which require, uh, requires us to have a better coordination. That doesn't mean that the city um, is going to run out Run, run out of these uh, products tomorrow. It just means that we need to pay a little bit more attention uh, to these uh, groups of, of, um, of um, uh, food. Um, and then our next step um, is to establish effective partnerships and uh, reliable sources of information. And that's, uh, that is what we are looking at right now. Um, basically, these two maps compare where uh, vulnerable populations are located and um, where do we have infrastructure, municipal infrastructure, so that we can reach easier uh, to these uh, vulnerable populations. We, we are showing here uh, zonal administration offices, which are basically the presence of the municipality of Quito uh, spread in the territory. And um, Casa, Somoch, we, Casa Somos, which are basically uh, public communal spaces that are provided by the municipality of Quito. And these spaces work on a regular basis uh, to provide services such as, um, I don't know, lessons uh, to learn how to um, start a new business or um, dancing lessons and so on. So all these spaces are being used in a different way um, uh, these days. But also, it allows us to understand how the food offer is um, 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 distributed in the territory, either uh, for um, coming from the, 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 the public offer, meaning public uh, markets, for example, uh, and also uh, coming from the pr uh, private offer, meaning um, large um, markets and um, small, small stores and how they are distributed. And then we can compare that to um, how the vulnerable population is located. What is interesting here is that uh, we can also see, for example, where do we have food deserts uh, in the city, meaning that uh, where we need to make um, um, stronger efforts to provide food and, ma and make food accessible uh, for vulnerable populations. And the next one is about health offer. Uh, how are the health, um, uh, how are hospitals, clinics, and pharmacies uh, distributed uh, in the territory um, re with respect to vulnerable population? So how, how easy it is uh, for uh, the municipality or, or anyone else to um, uh, make available these services uh, for the people who may might be infected, uh, for example? Uh, that, that also helps us to organize uh, uh, these, uh, these kind of services. And um, as, a, as, a, as a final step, and uh, I would like to be very emphatic uh, here, um, is the role of neighborhood leaders around this whole platform of uh, help that we are putting together here in Quito. And um, the important role that they have, uh, because at the end of the day, uh, first of all, they know uh, exactly where the where, where the most where, where the people who need uh, the most assistance are located, uh, so that we can really direct 
are, are helped there. Um, they help us to quantify in a more exact way um, the help needed. Um, and we, we already knew that this was going to be um, something um, required since we, like I mentioned before, we were depending on numbers that were put together almost 10 years ago. Um, they are also able to help us identify other special needs. For example, people who doesn't speak um, Spanish. And we have that since Quito is a city that receives uh, migration from different, different parts of the country that might not uh, speak Spanish. They might speak, for example, Quechua or any other languages. And um, they, they also uh, help us to organize better the assistance that is provided uh, within these neighborhoods. And um, uh, also to identify the most needed uh, from um, others that might want to take advantage of, of uh, this whole situation. And also they are a, a way to communicate inwards into the neighborhoods, but also outwards. So what we are looking right now here in these two maps is the feedback from these uh, neighborhood leaders with uh, crucial locations um, where we have a vulnerable population that are already being attended or that they need to be attended. So it is a two-way street. And uh, I think this collaboration is, is proving to be uh, quite su successful uh, so far. And um, uh, as, uh, as, 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 as closing, uh, uh, for this presentation, we have found some challenges, but we also have identified some opportunities, and I think it's important to highlight them. Um, when it comes to challenges, uh, I think uh, we feel every day that we need to coordinate better between different levels of, of government, and this is important because um, the city has certain capacities and certain uh, competences, and we need to uh, articulate and we need to be complemented uh, with uh, the central government, for example. But we are also, we, we also need we, we are also feeling that we need to better coordinate between uh, different municipal agencies, and, and, and this is true. I mean, it has been an, an in, in, interesting ex exercise to have the social inclusion uh, secretary work together with um, the um, secretary that works in the territory. Um, but also when it comes to moving information from one side to another, uh, for example, that can be uh, um, we, uh, we also understand that we have to better coordinate with stakeholders. Uh, there, there are questions of how can from private uh, partners, for, for example, uh, of how can, be, how can they be uh, more helpful and how can they be more efficient. Um, this is, and, and, and the whole exercise um, has been um, um, important in order in order to uh, solve uh, this challenge uh, or to face this challenge, but we still need to work into that. Like I was mentioning before, adjustments, uh, adjust interventions in the territory as we go on, as we move forward, um, is important because uh, we have um, a city that is driven uh, largely by informal settlements and um, people living in, in informality and so on. And so there are uncharted territories or, or unknown, unknown information along the territory. And so we need to adjust as we as we move forward. And the other and the other challenge is that not is that not every neighborhood leader or or a, not every neighborhood is able to cooperate in the same way. It depends on how well organized they are and it depends on how strong the leadership of these neighborhood leaders um, uh, is uh, and so on. That, that, that can also be a challenge and that might need that, um, that might require an, an additional effort from uh, municipal, municipal uh, technicians, technicians and officials. But we also have opportunities. We are able to really reach out the most needed and make sure that no one is left behind in this, um, during these uh, times. Uh, we also see that even though there are these challenges that I, that I was mentioning before, we are able to build social support and, 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 to, and, and to have trust and, and, and have people voluntarily comply with different uh, required measures uh, as we move forward in, in, in our efforts. 
Uh, it is also a very nice opportunity to test in place regulations for risk response and understand how do we need to adjust uh, different actions. Um, it is also an opportunity to be better prepared to implement recovery programs after the pandemia, which are uh, being designed uh, right now. What I was just showing is a small part or a component um, of um, the, res the, the, the response uh, strategy of the city, which uh, for right now what I showed you is the urgent uh, response, but we have a uh, more medium and long-term response uh, to th that is uh, being designed and so on. But, uh, but overall, I think we this this uh, this whole um, um, uh, this whole uh, thing around uh, what is going on should be uh, a warning and in, in, in a way to learn and, and to be better prepared to face other different uh, challenges in the future. Either when it comes, either if it is about um, climate change or if it is about any other uh, uh, disruptive events that might um, affect us. And uh, just when I just like to say that this is not one person um, effort. I mean, we've been working with um, four people, uh, which is a core team, but we are able to, this through these four people that are located in, in different uh, um, agencies in the municipality to amplify uh, these efforts and, and we have been achieving these results but I think um, it is important also to thank uh, everyone in planning and who are working in the territory in the city and uh, the last thing that I would say is that facing these kind, kind of challenges it, re it requires a city not only its citizens or not only um, um, authorities so that, that is the presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, David, uh, for this very interesting presentation. This is Vasilis Latinos, CICLE European Secretary of Speaking. Um, I see already many questions coming in. Uh, please, if you have more questions for David, uh, add them in the chat log and we will pick them uh, later at the Q&A session. Uh, moving now ahead, uh, you know, all of you, the whole of Italy has been under lockdown for almost a month now, and the city of Milan specifically has been a lot in the news as one of the cities that have been mostly affected by the pandemic. We are pleased to have with us today uh, Piero Pellizzaro, who will be the next presenter of this webinar. Uh, Piero has uh, 10 years of experience in climate change policies and urban resilience planning. Currently, he's a uh, Milan Chief Resilience Officer uh, and the city lead for the Horizon 2020 Lighthouse Project, Sharing Cities. He's also advisor at the Italian Ministry of Environment, Land and Sea on urban adaptation policy to climate change, uh, while he has also been the co-founder of Climalia, a specialized consulting company providing climate services in Italy. Uh, Piero, the floor is yours. If you can please share your screen. Great. Okay. <laughs> Everything is settled. So, uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, the ICLE World Secretariat, uh, the European Secretariat, and all ICLE for supporting this webinar and supporting all the cities uh, to link each other and to find uh, the proper way to get out from this emergency. On the other end, let me thank all the doctor, all the nursery, and all the staff uh, of the health. Um, system institution in Italy that they are in the front line and is the one that is suffering more because they are exposed themselves to the virus uh, to uh, give hope and to the other people. So thank you very much for all that. So um, where we are, the city of Milan uh, has, um, has started the first uh, um, containment measures was the 23rd of February was not the lockdown, but the first measures introduced that has been reducing the time of which that we can stay out was uh, published the 23rd of February. So it's uh, almost a month enough that uh, we are living uh, with limitation. Let me just uh, go through an initial step um, just to clarify where as a city of Milan we can stand. Uh, here in Italy, there is three different level of uh, institutional level, and all the health decisions are in charge of the national government, 
the Parliament, the civil protection, and with the support of the scientific institute, of the Health Scientific Institute, that is uh, composing the uh, scientific committee that is supporting our Prime Minister and all the government in taking the, this hard decision. On the second hand, there is the regional government. The regional government is in charge to managing, in the normal time and even now, the health system. So as a city, we don't have any kind of uh, power to decide over health measures. So we are implementing and um, supporting the regional government and the national government to decide to implement all the decisions and the restrictions we have, that have been introduced. I think this is really important, especially the city is uh, involved directly on all social policy that now can support uh, the, um, the community that is not infected by the virus, but is affected by the quarantine and the lockdown, and they are suffering uh, for, the, for this kind of reason. Um, so what we have done until now, uh, the city, uh, the city, uh, has applied the first decree uh, on the 11th of March, and we had the what well, we're going through all this uh, over the presentation. Uh, that it's uh, we have introduced emergency measures uh, guaranteeing the essential services, and one of the initial uh, measures we had taken was the tax relief for our commercial activities. That it's really important. Then we have been seeing other kind of measures related to uh, to mobility and. Uh, on the 13th of March, there is taking uh, this hard decision as well to close uh, the green space. Uh, I was saying hard decision because we are fully aware that uh, walking, running, being outside, even leaving, giving uh, even a short time of open air activity is important uh, to keep uh, our health and our mental um, health uh, fine and, and being um, good for, for, for us. But we need to, to go through this. Uh, let me just go through the uh, more in detail to how we the city has been organized since the beginning. The the city has organized itself in uh, three different levels. Uh, we have uh, colleagues that is running in the emergency management, especially the department of city protection and the department of the social services uh, and the housing department. And let me say there are the three, and let me thanks all my colleagues that there are. Uh, giving uh, as much as possible their support to all the community. On the other hand, we have the support for the community not infected and forced to quarantine and the lockdown. Uh, in this case, uh, colleagues, uh, especially colleagues um, dealing with um, with the shop, uh, dealing uh, with uh, the urban economy, there are the transition, the transitional environment, environmental transition department, the one that is dealing with waste, and then we look how uh, we move it. And then on the task force, there is a task force that is now looking to how to settle, how to design a plan zero for when the emergency ends. Uh, on these topics, I, go, I will go uh, later on, uh, but let me say that uh, since the beginning, that we were expecting to design a plan zero for the day zero when the emergency ends, we are now start considering how we can have a recovery plan that is starting today and is, adapt, and is capable to adapt to the different level uh, or different phase that uh, from the lockdown we will maybe move in the next uh, few months because the real emergency the lockdown then it could be a quarantine with less restriction and then we don't know yet and we will not know for another few days when it could be the day zero so it's also important to think how to design a plan zero that could be adaptable to the different level and stage of the emergency so there is a, uh, I also have a question uh, for all you, maybe from some other that is attending and it could be also helpful for us uh, to uh, collect more information. Uh, how to involve citizens during the quarantine or the lockdown, so how we can get uh, community involved. We have some idea, but maybe we are looking for new. How to rethink the ordinary and essential services for citizens, uh, how we should adapt them to the current emergency. Uh, there is always a need to better understand the communicate how we communicate with the citizen and to provide uh, uh, reliable information um, then we have how to combat uh, distrust and uh, in an institution where the important messages need to be conveyed to the population so if someone has some ideas on this and we are more than happy to, to, to collect 
So first, uh, uh, the first emergency management we have taken is was to focus on how the city organization, the city man, uh, the city municipality, could keep working in a time of emergency. So um, from the 24th of February until the 28th of February, we were capable to move more than 4,000 uh, public servants from a desk office to a smart working. Uh, for a country as Italy, with a big digital divide between new generation and the old generation, being capable to have 4,000 public servants that are working from home and they guarantee their uh, support to all the community is an important and an unbelievable uh, step. And nowadays, we all uh, at work and we guarantee uh, all our activities on the normal life. And this is also thanks to the previous work uh, that uh, the city has implemented with a digital agenda. So here we can also see having a digital agenda before how could help in our times of, uh, of an emergency. Uh, on the second hand, we have to take some important uh, decision over, uh, over mobility. Uh, as you maybe know, the city of Milan uh, has in place a congestion charge, a pollution charge. Uh, we have suspended the pollution charge, the congestion charge for the time of emergency. And we also um, have suspended the ban uh, for um, restricted uh, traffic areas uh, to allow uh, emergency vehicles and all the people to move much easier uh, in the city. And uh, this is an important uh, decision was taken because it's also uh, a cultural uh, background of the city itself. On the other hand, uh, since the beginning, we move all our educational program, that is, uh, that it's the city is in charge, from offline to online, to keep going uh, all the educational program to sustain the community's home, and especially with the family that we were forced to move back home, the smart working, so, and they have kids home, so we try to keep their life as much as possible the same as before, and to support mommy and daddy to can work in the meantime, uh, puppies are home. Um, on the other end, to support family, especially in the educational framework, we have suspended uh, the fee uh, for the canteen, the school canteen, but also the fee uh, for the school itself. Uh, this is uh, an important, uh, uh, we believe it was an important uh, support for the economic point of view for the family itself. Uh, at the same time, uh, because we, we we want to let uh, the community having the um, uh, the lockdown as much as possible easier, we were uh, working, we were glad to work together with our uh, public library and also our cinema library. So at the moment, we have more uh, uh, 33,000 uh, free downloaded ebooks, and we have thousands of movies that are now free for streaming uh, for all the Milanese community. That it's a small piece, but I think it's also important to try to support the community in having cultural activities during the lockdown. Um, on the other end, that it's, uh, we were working on the um, administrative administration services. So um, we have uh, the, the, register, the register office, uh, so for, um, for new birth or for death. Uh, are still open. Uh, if you need to work and to go to the to the desk, uh, is possible. You, we settle our numbers. That is zero two zero two zero two, and you can call and you can get an appointment. And we have settled also the queue uh, in a way that could uh, respect uh, all the uh, limitation and restriction. Yeah. Uh, we have moved uh, more, we have now more than 120 types of services that could be requested from home, so the digitalization of our services. Uh, what is uh, another important thing that we, we were taking care of since the beginning uh, is the homeless. Uh, there is several thousand of homeless in the, in the city. Uh, that was at the beginning quite a critical situation because we had uh, at the beginning to suspend dormitories and public shower, but now we are reactivating and we also have, uh, we are given a new uh, bed and new room uh, using one of our public residential buildings that is now uh, being used for homeless people. So to keep them safe as well uh, in a the house. Then uh, we have tax payment. There is uh, a lot of uh, intervention made by our, by our government, our Premier Conte. Um, they have created a redundancy fund 
And there is now uh, a lump sum compensation of 600 euro for all freelance workers. We also have settled, and we can see later, a mutual aid fund that is uh, with a 3 million euro investment by the city and budget. Uh, uh, the mutual aid fund is going to support the social services, but as well all, all the other workers from the freelance but in the development world that are not being supported in the framework uh, of the traditional workers. That is, uh, as for a city as Milan, as could be London or other cities around the globe that have a lot, that base a lot of their economy on the entertainment, this is essential because otherwise we have a lot of people that are going to suffer. Uh, looking at the tax for the city, we have now uh, split the tax on waste, the, tar, the so-called tari. Before it was in two rate, now it's, uh, it's four payments. So we are trying to support like splitting. Um, we have uh, delayed uh, the payment for the public housing. Um, we have also redefined uh, the cause of this, uh, the taxes over the public space use. Public space use. Uh, there is, um, partially there is a stop and there was a stop, but at the same time there was a refund uh, for the mark for February and for March. Uh, for the school canteen and the kindergarten taxi. Then uh, on the emergency one related to housing. A uh, few days ago, uh, the city has uh, taken together with, and I, the, on this, I want to, uh, to thank all the private community, the private companies community Milan. We are now taking a hotel with 500 room. This 500 room is now uh, being uh, used by people in quarantine. This is our, it's quarantine with, um, with a level of infection that is lower uh, and that is not required a constant medical support. Uh, this is because we want to support and to help hospital to have less people uh, in the hospital. So now we are using public budget and we are supporting the hospital, hosting people in quarantine or they are at the end of their quarantine. And this is an important step. On the other hand, we have a call for a public bid. Uh, the city is uh, it's now empty, as you can imagine, empty of tourists, empty of, of businessmen. So there is plenty of room and house around the city that normally has been used for tourist purpose or for business purpose. And we are now asking to support the community, giving and allowing to be to use this uh, this empty house for all the new doctor and nursery coming to Lombardy region to, uh, from the other part of Europe, uh, of Italy, but at the same time to support also, I can give you an example of what is also happening, that you have people getting harm from the hospital, but they cannot get go back home because they are family that are maybe still in quarantine. So they are out in the street and we are now uh, supporting these people that have this kind of issue to find a place and we support economically also these people to get um, a proper uh, place and a proper and a proper lunch and dinner every day. Um, so there was, I was mentioning before is the mutual aid fund that we have launched uh, on this after the 3 million euro uh, donated by, by the city. So it's the launch of the fund. We received so many funds from, from private company to financial sector and to individuals. So thank you all for the, for the support. And I think it's important. It's the first, it's one of the first measures of the recovery plan, if you want to consider. So uh, tourism and event. At the beginning, we were more confident to postpone part of our events because uh, canceling an event is also affecting the economy later on. Uh, we had postponed as much as possible all our uh, events, but uh, sadly, we had to learn to cancel the design week. The design week. We postponed in 2021. Uh, it is only an event, but it's uh, for the economics of the city. It's really one of the biggest uh, events we are hosting, so have a huge impact on our on our budget. And uh, on the other hand, we had to look also uh, the psychological support uh, and activities because let me say that it's something that it's always important to remember that there is an emergency now, but there was an emergency before. The people were suffering before, they are still suffering even this time. And we need to look how to support all these people as much as possible in, a, in, a, in the best way. So um, on this, we, are, we have a lunch, we have a sort of uh, Milano Ayuta. Milano Ayuta, it's a, it's, a, it's a platform, 
it's a platform of community that uh, uh, give and support all the, uh, the most vulnerable population in, in terms of education, assistance, sleeping, uh, uh, advice, uh, personal hygiene, accommodation, and also to support uh, minors in the in the in, in, in public space. Going to food, it was something that was always mentioned before uh, by, by my friend David. Uh, the city, and this is thanks a lot to all who has been working since 2015 on the Milan Food Pact and the Milan Food Policy, because that is uh, a great result of our previous policy. We have now set up seven different hubs in the city that are delivering food to uh, low-income population and rural population in the easiest and the fastest way. The seven up uh, are working with a, a, a community of volunteers that are supporting uh, colleagues in delivering the food on this. And that will also lead to the other uh, activity we have done. We have now been published uh, a platform uh, looking at the local shop in the cities. So we also try to support people to look where do you have a shop that could deliver or a shop where you can go that is really close to your house. Because you have to remember that we have a limitation that we cannot walk for more than two, far than more than 200 meters from home. So when I step out from my home, I, only, I can only walk uh, uh, until 200 meters from, from my door. And so that is also a way how we can support you with this. And uh, to move faster, because I know there is a lot of a lot of questions, I, I want to uh, uh, to just highlight a few things. One is the uh, genization and uh, and the cleaning of the street. And since the beginning, all our public transport, all every single vehicle every night has been uh, hygienized uh, strongly. Has the the, uh, the bus stop has the street as well. Another things that is important is the waste collection. At the moment, the government and institution decide that for the people in quarantine, we have to suspend the um, separate waste uh, waste collection. So all these people have to put all their um, waste in one single bed. Uh, one single bed. We are collecting the bed, and this bed is going to be uh, buried. Uh, there is uh, an indication that if we are uh, lack of, if we have a lack of a person that's working on the waste management. Uh, the door-to-door -door collection, separate work, it could be uh, suspended. We are now having a great um, answer and support by uh, our waste management company. So all the workers are home, are home at work, and they are fully operational, and we are providing them with all the equip uh, medical equipment uh, necessary to avoid being infected. So also the waste is becoming something really important. What we also have lunch. It's a campaign to remember to all of our community uh, that our water is uh, the tap water. It's uh, it's uh, it's clean, it's clean, and it can be uh, used. And also help us to avoid to go to a shop just to buy water because there was in the beginning a lot of people going there buying toilet paper and water. At the end of this emergency, we could start thinking why people are buying toilet paper and water so much all over the globe. That is a, a funny part of the story, let's say. Um, so we have also a support from distance uh, learning, support from, from education. And let's say, uh, because I, I don't want to take too much time, I'm sorry to be late a bit. Uh, we have seen three, um, uh, three main pillars at the moment that was uh, for, for the recovery plan. The environmental transition, so decarbonization, it's one of the uh, pillars we are we are thinking. Well, the other one is social justice, and the third one is equity. How we move through this one? Well, there is a question open: how we can improve the digital infrastructures and do you know this environmental transition. I think that uh, energy efficiency and building retrofit for starting from our building, it could be one of the pillars of the recovery plan. So um, I will um, stop here. Uh, let me just show. Uh, here is the picture, just because we are with you, that we are all the time speaking about climate change and air pollution. That was uh, uh, Italy before the virus. That is Italy after the virus. So even if it is not the way we should uh, thinking about an environmental transition, because an emergency like that, it could be not the example we want to take it. But uh, there is a significant, significant um, message we can out from the emergency. If we want to change, we can change, and the changes could be uh, visible in a short term.
So uh, thank you very much and keep safe and stay home. Great. Thanks a lot, uh, Piero. Always good to uh, to have a positive note at the end. Uh, we have a lot of questions um, and uh, we are trying to cluster them now and uh, we don't have much time, but we will try to uh, answer as many as possible. Um, a question first to David. Um, you probably do uh, similar analysis that the ones you presented, combining indicators for the purpose of modeling for your day-to-day -day work. Uh, how did the pandemic now modify your model and the analysis that you're doing? Have you found also that the partners that you work with have the ability to respond and contribute fast enough to meet the new needs the city has? Um, thank you. Thank you very much for the question. And um, I think it's. I think the question is very on point on on how to handle um, information in, in, in these times. And and I have to say. Um, much of the information is av uh, available, but also if we really want to understand better how the, the, the pandemia is hitting us and how will it affect us, uh, we, need, we need to increase our capacity to analyze information on one hand and on the other hand, uh, locate information in other different places. Uh, one of the weaknesses that we have here is that information is scattered in, in, in different agencies and in, in different um, or with other different um, stakeholders from outside the municipality, uh, which makes it a, a little bit difficult. Uh, but actually, um, one of the one of the steps that we are taking is to actually uh, put together a platform that will help us not only through these times, but also through other difficult times. And um, somehow the, the, the whole uh, situation is helping us to um, call in um, some of these stakeholders and, and, and gather uh, information. Um, the other, the other, um, the other challenge that we face is actually how to put together uh, that information so that it can be analyzed, uh, analyzed in a proper way and, and really uh, become useful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, we have um, a question um, for Piero now. Um, so what do you foresee as being the new normal after the end of COVID-19? And how do you link this uh, to, the, um, to the recovery plan for the city? I try to uh, well the new normal uh, and, and the recovery. Yeah, that's uh, that's a good question. And I, I I don't know what is going to be the new normal. What we know is that uh, this is going to affect our way of approaching to the public space, for example, because we have uh, maybe learned how good it is to have the freedom to go to the park and how much uh, we need more space on the street in case of emergency to have the proper distance from each other. Uh, it comes pretty clear, as my personal opinion on this one, that cars is one of the big obstacles in city because normally it's uh, creating pollution and on the other hand is taking space from people. Uh, and so there is um, a huge need uh, after this to redesign the public space uh, based on the needs that comes over this, this day. Uh, it comes pretty clear that the new normal have to maybe rethinking how we approach to internet uh, and the digital infrastructures. Uh, maybe we should start really question ourselves if internet has to be considered a public good because that it comes uh, essential for the emergency management, the management but also for the others. And, and, and the other, and let me just uh, having a kind of call for action for all of us, uh, city is the place where this virus is being affected more, and cities that pull together the demand for the carbonization, the recovery plan, they could be really the leader uh, of the new uh, normal where the carbonization, environmentalization and climate change as we see not as an environmental action, but as the opportunity to recover the economy uh, as much as possible. Uh, thank you very much. And then uh, we have a last question for both Piero and David. Um, first, how do you, how many of these adaptations are a result of your resilience 
resilience position or your office? And um, how do you think the authorities or powers of the city governments will or should change during and after this crisis? I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry, my, my, recep my reception uh, of the question was not so good. Audio failed a little. Could you please repeat the question? Yes, sorry. So first, how many of these adaptations are a result of your resilience position or your office? What is the most significant added value of a CRO during these times? And the other question is, how do you think the authorities and powers of the cities, of the city governments will, will or should change during and after this crisis? Thank you. I, I will go first if uh, Piero doesn't mind. Um, well, um, I was, as I was mentioning before, um, in, during my presentation, uh, the location of vulnerable pop population and how we were uh, mapping out risk in the city of Quito is one of the actions uh, of the resilience strategy of the city. Um, and now that information is also available through the public platform of the of the municipality. Um, so uh, that that was of use. That was a, a, of a lot of help uh, during this time. During these times, because the information was was there. Uh, and uh, there are some other aspects that we have been working on. Uh, for example, strengthening the food system of the city. And actually, we are. We were uh, about to finish the, re the, the the resilience strategy of the whole food, si food system, and um, uh, our approach during that exercise, not only mine but especially uh, from the um, secretary of uh, productive development, which is the one in charge of, of uh, uh, food systems and, and, and so on, um, helped us to coordinate better and to have at hand uh, different stakeholders to. Uh, to help um, during these times. Um, uh, that is uh, also uh, a second very, uh, very good example. Uh, the other, the other um, point that I think it's quite important is that uh, while implementing the resilience strategy, one of the actions was to um, teach uh, neighborhood leaders how to uh, put together and how to propose and, and how to come up with uh, neighborhood uh, development plans. And th that was made through um, an ordinance that, that ba basically regulates uh, citizen participation. And um, this whole exercise um, has been also a proof of how effective um, that distance that was initially between the municipality and these leaders and the neighborhoods has been closed uh, to create uh, this um, closer uh, cooperation and I and I must say that the whole um, platform for for citizen participation enabled not only to implement the resilience strategy by making these uh, agendas but also some other um, uh, activities and, and processes that the municipality of Quito has so uh, I, I think it has uh, contributed but we must understand that the resilience strategy um, is not one uh, or is not the only strategy. We have the development plan of the city that we also need to connect to uh, and which guides basically most of the actions in the, in, in the city or the climate change ad adaptation plan, uh, which is also going on together. And the resilience strategy tries to connect with all these different uh, planning instruments as well and, 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 and to work together. Hello? Yes, Jim yeah, Wesbrook. Uh, so, can you just like briefly repeat the question? I'm so, so sorry for this. Uh, it's it's more the, the adaptive capacity, right? Um, yes, the question is about um, how much of the adaptation was a result of your position as a chief resilience officer, and also how do you think? the authority, like the powers of the city governments should change after this crisis? Uh, I think that there was a, a composition of, um, uh, of, of different policy and a different uh, goals. Uh, the work has been, has been done on the smart cities, but looking more at the smart community and less at technology 
the shared economy work has been done, the food policy, uh, the vulnerable analysis and the resilience, uh, the premium resilience assessment, uh, all these um, innovative um, solution has been adopted during the last uh, seven and up to eight years have been shown all their benefits uh, for the community in a, time of, in a times of emergency. So I, I believe that there is not only what we have been done, uh, but it's what the city has been done in terms of rethinking itself uh, over the last uh, few few years. So uh, what is confirmed by us that is that uh, the vulnerable um, the vulnerability of the city were well identified. But there is something interesting in our preliminary resilience assessment when we had the stakeholder participation of the community, no one was believing that pandemia could be happen uh, in a city. So we didn't have a pandemia in our uh, resilience assessment. So that is something interesting to explore uh, after. Well, the, how is the public station we're going to change? Well, we're already changing. And we have all of us are in smart working. That is the first step and how we need to, to change. I think there is something that we need to all, globally speaking, improve is the predictive model. And we need to consider the worst case scenario nowadays has been possible in terms of uh, pandemia, because what we are living, I think was predictable, but not thinkable. So uh, because scenario and the, the modeling always create also this kind of scenario. It's a matter of public institution decide if we want to include uh, the worst case scenario in our uh, in our measures or the measures or not. And the thing that all of this crisis has shown that from China to US to UK to Europe to to the others, where kind of uh, uh, they need to improve their capacity to include uh, worst case scenario as part of the emergency measures. So I think that is one of the most important things. And on the other end, uh, I think that we need, and it's a clear need, that it's every day more important to have a community uh, approach, uh, imagine cities, because now we are asking for the community to be part of the emergency plan. So we need to get community uh, more and more involved, not only in the consultation process, but also in services. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, Piero. Uh, thanks a lot, David. And with that, with those answers and just a couple of minutes before the end, trying to summarize all this, what's been said today, it's always tricky. Uh, definitely cities and local governments need to rethink the way of moving, to rethink the economy, and um, we can have definitely with a, a shift to more publicly owned digital infrastructure should be considered. Um, my notes here reach out to the most needed, to the most uh, vulnerable population, also make sure that no one is left behind. We need to build more resilient social services and support, and also to build trust uh, to comply with the required measures when it comes to our common good. It definitely, uh, what seems very possible is that the coronavirus pandemic will leave its mark uh, on cities and urban centers long after the outbreak itself um, uh, goes away. In many cases, um, also the outbreak will accelerate trends that are already underway. And the new normal that we talk about maybe somehow feel, feel pretty normal in the next uh, months. Um, before we close, uh, Victoria, you would like to announce something? Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Piero and David, and thanks to Vasileios and Zoe um, for uh, helping uh, with this uh, webinar. Um, so to stay tuned for updates uh, from the ECLA's uh, Resilient Development Pathway and Program, we invite you to answer uh, the survey at the end of the webinar. And uh, we will share the recording and presentations with you. And we will also um, share the questions, the many questions you've uh, sent to us, to our speakers and ask them um, to, to do their best, uh, maybe to get back to you uh, with some answers to them. And yeah, that's all from my part. Um, thank you very much. And we hope to, uh, to meet with you again in our next webinar. Thank you. Goodbye.